Um, they'll also, NIPMO and DSI will also indicate the outcomes of the NIPMO review and progress on the IPR Act. Um, they'll also indicate how DSI and TIA, and TIA are using um, intellectual property to transform ownership of the economy, including links to the Department of Higher Education um, through TVET colleges. And lastly, on South Africa's patent um, development landscape. So that's the briefing that we'll be receiving this morning. I'd like to hand over to um, DDG Tutoy to then take us through the presentation. And once DM has joined the platform, we'll get some remarks from him as well. Thank you very much. And over to you, DDG Tutoy. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Good morning to you and good morning to all the honorable members of this committee. Once again, it's a, it's a privilege uh, for the Department of Science and Innovation to, to present to you and to engage with you on, on really a strategic matter, which is crucial for the well-being of our national system of innovation and our, and our efforts to, to really unleash the potential of innovation to make a difference in economic growth and employment creation. Of course, intellectual property is a, is a key enabling mechanism for innovation to make that um, difference in our economy. So as we proceed with the implementation of our decadal plan, we, we value the opportunity to present um, to the committee this morning. Honorable Chair, with your permission, I just want to briefly um, introduce the, the colleagues who are, are with me. I'm accompanied by Acting Deputy Director General, Dr. Rebecca Masrimule, who is responsible for the technology innovation uh, port portfolio, uh, who, including responsibility for the National Intellectual Property Management Office, as, as well as by Advocate Jatan Sharsley, who is the head of the National Intellectual Property Management Office. And um, Jatan will be the one who will be delivering the presentation. Honorable Chair, as you said, of course, Intellectual property is, is cross-cutting the national system of innovation. So we're also doing this uh, presentation in partnership with our entities and specifically the Technology Innovation Agency, where we have the acting CEO for the Technology Innovation Agency, uh, Mr. Mr. Patrick Crappy, as well as senior executive, uh, Mr. Vusi uh, Skosana, who has joined us um, uh, for for this 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 briefing this more as well as Vuyisile um, Behani from 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 Tia. So, honourable chair, with with that introduction, um, with no further ado, I'm going to invite Jatani to deliver the presentation to us, and then we look forward to to a rich engagement with the committee. Thank you, Jatani, please. Uh, thank you so much, Acting DG Don the Toy. I am putting up my presentation. I believe that it is now in um, presentation mode. Can I maybe get confirmation from you, Acting DG? It's perfect, Jatani. You can proceed. Thank you so much. Uh, colleagues and everyone on the platform, thank you so much for this opportunity to provide this very important platform with an update um, on the activities within the National Intellectual Property Management Office, or NIPMO, as well as the activities of our sister agency, the Technology and Innovation Agency. We will do a handover. I will do the first few, the, the first um, uh, slides I will do. Then I will hand over to my colleagues at TIA to do item number two, and then they will hand back to me for item number three. So this is just what we were requested to present on. And without further ado, I will go into the first one. NIPMO and DSI, specifically the outcome of the National Intellectual Property Management Office review, as well as the progress to date. Um, for the amendments of the Intellectual Property Rights from Publicly Financed Research and Development Act amendment process. We have been going through a very long journey so far. It all started in 2010, August, with the promulgation of the Intellectual Property Rights from Publicly Financed Research and Development Act, with the objectives to ensure that intellectual property emanating from publicly financed research and development is identified, protected, utilized and commercialized for the benefit of the people of the Republic. And with this very great objective and intention, an office of the uh, NIPMO office was established in 2011 and through various interventions, specifically with National Treasury, NIPMO was established as the first ever specialized service delivery unit in South African government 
in 2013, with the head being appointed on a permanent basis. This led the way in April for 2014 for the Department of Public Service Administration to approve the NIP organogram and appoint the uh, employees permanently within this NIPMO um, unit or structure. In May 2015, the then minister took a decision to develop a framework to assess the impact that the IPR Act, as well as NIPMO, had on the national system of innovation. The TOR was finalized in, uh, the terms of reference was finalized in 2017, and the review or the panel um, started their work in 2017 at the, towards the end of the year. By June 2019, the review panel completed its review on the IPR Act as well as NIPMO and had several recommendations. Overall, they felt that the IPR Act as well as the role of NIPMO has been positive for the national system of innovation and that there was an increased awareness and support for intellectual property, for the disclosure of those um, research outputs or intellectual property, and for the strategic management of such an important asset. It also found that there has been a positive impact on the commercialization of intellectual property, which emanated from publicly financed research and development. But they did note that this effort can be improved. They have found key problems within the IPR Act itself, NIPMO, as well as the uh, National System of Innovation in general, which may limit the contribution that the IPR Act and NIPMO has in the protection and commercialization of publicly financed research and development. I will delve into these key problems identified in the coming slides. To just complete the journey so far, in December, Minister noted the recommendation to December 2020, the Minister noted the recommendations made by the review panel and approved the initiation uh, or the, this, this implementation or start of the process for the amendment of the IPR Act to address some of these concerns. In March 2021, the DSI Exco approved the process and noted that in addition to the review, NIPMO has over the years collated in the 10 years that we've been in existence, every query related to the IPR Act, we have logged and we, the response provided, we have also logged. We have therefore formed a, like a, a database of every query that we've received and want to incorporate any amendments that we see might need, be needed into the amendment process as well. Over the 10 years, we did not just have the NIPMA review, we also had a NIPMA advisory board that indicated some shortcomings. We had various NIPMA workshops and the NIPMA queries that were all now incorporated into a master document that will form the basis for the amendments of the IPR Act. In 2022, the NIPMA office undertook an online benchmarking study to benchmark with other very similar legislations, including the Chinese, Brazil, United States, and Indian legislations that make provision for the protection of publicly funded intellectual property and how to deal with that. We also, in August of 2020, NIPMO hosted and partook in an informal knowledge exchange workshop to gather international best practice, practices and lessons learned and the countries that participated were the United Kingdom, Brazil, Canada, and Singapore. What I can say that was very interesting about this um, informal knowledge exchange is that it was comforting to see that with countries with similar legislation that they are all struggling with commercialization of intellectual property and how to positively and correctly manage it. So, um, it was comforting to know that we were not the only ones that can improve on the commercialization of our publicly funded intellectual property. Before I go on with um, what would be the way forward for 2023, may I, may I just maybe highlight some of the key problems identified. If we go to the key problems identified in the IPR Act itself, the review panel noted that 
there were deficiencies in some of the definitions in the legislation that would need some attention, as well as the objectives of some of the um, categories. It also highlighted that there is a need to clarify the scope of the IPR Act, specifically whether this would relate to only universities and science councils, where the majority of publicly funded research and development is taking place, or that it should apply to all recipients that receive public funding and undertake research and development. The review panel noticed that we need to clarify in the amendment the categorization of state-owned entities and how and where they fit into this legislation and how they should report on their intellectual property generated from the public purse. There was also a need to streamline the reporting requirements even further and the panel noted that there was generally an overall compliance from our universities and science councils. But unfortunately, a general failure by non-institutional entities to comply with the legislation. We um, put forward that this might be due to a lack of awareness of the legislation for institutions that's not universities or science councils, maybe lack of enforcement or lack of sanctions within the legislation. And then the review panel noted that there was an incoherence between the support provided from NIPMO's side for institutions versus other recipients. In terms of the current practices within NIPMO, we have an intellectual property fund that funds up to 50% for IP prosecution and maintenance costs incurred within universities and science councils. And we also have an Office of Technology Transfer Support Fund, which helps with capacity development, training, technology transfer related activities within universities and science councils. At this stage, we do not have a dedicated fund for other recipients, which excludes universities and science councils. Key problems identified with the NIPMO itself was first and foremost, the institutional structure and location of NIPMO. Although the, panel, or, or, although the panel noted that the SSDU, the Specialized Service Delivery Unit within the DSI, made great strides to create independence for the head to make certain decisions, um, they noted that it is still a key concern for the independence and authority of NIPMO if it remains as a unit or an office within the Department of Science and Innovation. It further noted that there might be some tension between the primary objectives of NIPMO as we play the role of an enabler, where you can see we provide funding for capacity development, for, for helping with um, protection of intellectual property, and we are the enforcer of the legislation, and they note that there can be some tension. They further noted that NIPMO's engagement is strong, positive, and enabling with institutions, our universities and science councils, However, not that good or not that strong with institutions outside of universities and science councils. Um, although we are trying to address this in making SMME um, workshops, um, it is still not as good as our interactions with universities and science councils. And it might be that NIPMO is not necessarily aware or able to reach all of these recipients. The review panel further noted that human and financial resources of NIPMO was not adequate with um, insufficient people within the office and not always necessarily experienced enough to carry out commercialization support in enablement within the NSI. And it noted that NIPMO's ability to monitor impact and progress should be enhanced. When we look forward to what they found generally with regards to the NSI, the review panel noted that the roles and interaction between NIPMO, our sister agency that will present next, the Technology Innovation Agency, the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission, or our, our Patent and Trademark Office, THRIP, SPY, the Departments of DSI and Trade Industry and Co uh, Competition, should be looked at, streamlined, and ensure that we work together in a complementary fashion. It further noted that if commercialization and utilization of publicly funded intellectual property is the key driver, they will need to, we will need to look at the NSI to determine whether it's optimally structured 
to adequately enable commercialization, and to determine whether a single entity should take the sole responsibility and accountability for commercialization and providing that support, or whether it should be shared amongst others. All of these key problems are being identified, looked at, discussed within the DSI, and NIPMA will finalize a list um, informed by master documents and all of the documents that we've received and interactions we had to um, put forward possible amendments to the legislation. We will work hand in hand with the department's um, legal services to consider the proposed amendments. And then we will follow as a way forward the legislative requirements set up by parliament and the constitution, working to get the preliminary opinions from the Office of the State Law Advisor, presentations to cluster and cabinet to, for their consideration, as well as looking for public consultation, the translation, consolidation of um, all our inputs received from these uh, public comments, and then receiving the final documents for the introduction of the Bill in Parliament. As you can see, this is all very ambitious. Not all of this will happen in 2023, but we are putting forward and starting the process to make concerted efforts and making sure that the, in the amendments that we are proposing, that we can look for the unintended consequences, that we can assess where it is needed and make changes that will last another decade or two. And that was my brief presentation on the review of the IPR Act, as well as the proposed way forward. I am now going to hand over to my colleagues from the Technology Innovation Agency to take us through um, item number two on how the department, as well as the Technology Innovation Agency, are using intellectual property to transform ownership of the economy. Over to you, colleagues. Good morning, everyone. Patrick, would you like to, to lead and then I can come in? Uh, yes, got just some introductory remarks. Uh, good morning, members, and good morning, colleagues. I'll show my face briefly and disappear. I have a colleague of mine, uh, Mr. Garth Williams, who is our head of planning, monitoring, and evaluation. So he's the authority in TIA running the analytics in terms of how we are performing around the question of using publicly funded IP to transform the economy. So he put together a presentation. So I'm going to ask him to speak with authority on that. Uh, but broadly speaking, uh, just to remind members, fundamentally, TIA was established to stimulate innovation through translation and commercialization of publicly funded IP. So the universities and the research community, our primary customer. So our mandate is to make sure that we exploit IP that is uh, produced out of uh, the research conducted at the universities. We operate in an economy that has got structural challenges, of course, coming out of the legacy uh, of our history. And so much of what we traverse as we implement this mandate, we remain conscious of the need to do this. However, the one point perhaps that I need to just emphasize is that this transformation agenda does not come out of TIA's own wish on its own, but it's legislated requirement. And so it's important that we keep track on how we are performing against this. Our planning tool uh, developed by the uh, DPME requires that in every year when we define KPIs, we do indicate how we are going to support women, youth, people with disabilities, but in TIA we also add the notion of a geographical footprint expansion because that's quite important that we look at that. So a lot of the information that my colleague will present will show what results uh, we have uh, from our performance as an organization. So I thought I should just say that um, to say this is how we are approaching all of this. But I've got two other colleagues of mine, three other colleagues of mine who are implementing core parts of the mandate of TIA that can complement this Garth presents. Uh, thank you, Garth. I think you can proceed. 
Thank you, Patrick, um, and thanks to everyone for making this opportunity available to TIA. Um, I'm Garth Williams, the Head of Strategic Planning and Reporting at TIA, and um, uh, used to be at the Department of Science and Innovation, so um, it's good to see my former colleagues again. I'll turn off my camera and then we'll proceed with the presentation. And uh, thanks, Jitani, if I can just piggyback onto your presentation uh, for us to proceed smoothly. I think, Patrick, thank you. You've covered a lot of what the contents, what the this, this, what this slide is telling us. And TIA came about around about the same time as NAPMA, in fact, and are, were created to exist in concept. So the, there was the realization that the the so-called innovation chasm was present was preventing valuable intellectual property generated by local research from making it to the markets and therefore having an impact on society in terms of jobs and growth, etc. So, <clears throat> um, I think Patrick has covered a lot of the, the contents of this slide. So we can go to the next slide, please, Jitani. As Patrick has said, we we're very intentional about measuring how we are doing in terms of this is in a transformation efforts. And the white paper on science, innovation, and technology has transformation broadly uh, at its one of the underlying cross-cutting core themes behind the work of the National System of Innovation. And what we um, have started to do over the last few years is in line with tracking our performance against transformation targets is um, measuring how well we are doing in, at, the, at the indicator level. So one of the core indicators, the, I mean, so the indicators that you're seeing in front of you are what, three of the core indicators you, that TIA uses to measure its performance. And out of that performance, what we measure is the ownership or <clears throat> participation of women, youth, and people with disabilities. <coughs> Excuse me. And so the three graphs you're seeing um, shows you our targets and actual performance for the 2021-22 year. And that's the, the latest year of which data is available. Um, and so in terms of technologies licensed or assigned, and this would have been technology coming out of the public funded R&D systems out of universities and science councils, those technologies are then licensed or assigned to recipients for commercial or social gain. And you can see we're doing fairly well in terms of our meeting our sub targets uh, for women, youth and people with disabilities for that indicator. Um, similarly, but not uh, as well in terms of the bio-based technologies developed. Um, as the committee may know, TIA has a very strong biotechnology and bioeconomy focus, uh, which is why we have a, a specific indicator designed to see our impact in bio-based technologies developed. Um, unfortunately, we did not achieve the targets for people with disabilities for bio-based technologies developed, and neither did we achieve our targets for people with disabilities under technologies diffused. Now, the difference in terms of technologies diffused is that these are existing technologies which are diffused into communities mostly for social gain, although they are, they are economic gains that do accrue to the recipients but largely the technologies are diffused to improve livelihoods uh, or health of the recipients. So you'll see we've achieved the target for women, but unfortunately not for youth and people with disabilities in terms of technologies diffused. Next slide, please. The second important role of TIA is to support the innovation ecosystem. And um, the science, engineering, and technology supports, which we provide through various 
funded initiatives such as technology stations are aimed at supporting SMMEs um, as well as large businesses, but primarily um, the SMMEs, which is, as one, as you know, primary engine for job creation in any economy. And here we um, exceeded our targets, uh, sub targets for women and youth, but again, unfortunately, not people with disabilities. Um, a, a proxy in terms of the outputs of our system is knowledge and innovation products produced. These are items like patents and designs and technology packages. And unfortunately here, we didn't do too well in terms of the production of those knowledge and innovation products by women, youth, and people with disabilities. Moving back to the more core indicator, um, which is products launched. And this is really where the, the rubber hits the road. And you see a product being made available beyond just making a prototype or a laboratory uh, a technology demonstrator. These are products that are made available and are launched into a market, um, either for commercial, commercial or sometimes social gain. And here we've uh, done well in terms of the sub-targets for women, um, or just missed achieving the, the target for youth, and again, unfortunately, missed the target for people with disabilities. Next slide, please. So, so maybe just to um, sum up, and before I move to the contents of this slide, is members may, members may be a little disappointed in terms of how we are achieving, in, particularly in terms of, and Tony, if you can maybe just go back to the previous slide, certainly people with disabilities and the youth. Um, and in response, uh, let me just say, we are actually going to be launching, designing and launching focused programs that are going to be targeting innovation in support of people with disabilities, the youth, but also women. Um, it's, this is a new indicator that we have been tracking for the last few years. And what, the, what, it, what it tells us is that we could be doing more. We could be having uh, better interventions in this area. So while the picture is not great currently, and, and I think we have presented this data in a different form to the portfolio committee before, it does give us a starting point and a baseline upon which we plan on um, making additional interventions and hopefully improvements in our results. Next slide, please, to China. Members might be well aware of the Seed Fund. Um, seed Fund is a very popular and well-used and normally oversubscribed fund of the Technology Innovation Agency which we implement um, ourselves and also in partner, partnership with um, implementing agencies uh, in, in provinces. And that's reflected in the number of implementing partners. There are 36 partners with a portfolio of in excess of 230 active projects. And there they are strong uh, transformation imperatives within, within, the, um, within the seed fund program. Half are African, um, just slightly above a quarter are female and a quarter youth. Uh, and since the program's inception in 2018, there have been slightly less than 900 projects funded, um, of which slightly more than 10% have taken their products, projects to the market. And again, this is essentially the, the instrument is used to help with a little bit of extra funding to translate research outputs into fundable ideas for further development and commercialization. So this is, it's still um, partially pre-commercial, pre-revenue, pre but is helping researchers uh, within science councils and universities take that extra step to attract follow-on funding. Next slide, please. As per the white paper, and the, in fact, the original tense, intents of the, the, um, the previous white paper is in terms of having an impact and using science and innovation to have a broader impact on the economy. Grassroots innovation is, 
innovation that exists outside, largely outside of the formal structures of organizations and institutions and regulations in, in the national system of innovation. So this still with, exists within the national system of innovation, but um, works uh, essentially as, as, as the name suggests at a grassroots level, at a community level. And we've been implementing grass, the grassroots innovation program on behalf of the Department of Science and Innovation for a few years now. Uh, and again, there's been really a great uptake of this instrument amongst the innovators um, with 139 innovators across all nine provinces. Um, and 20, as the slides says, 26 innovation products produced and several new enterprises created. And <clears throat> in the previous year, we also had product launches, which were done virtually, and this was under uh, COVID conditions, um, very successfully for women and for the youth. So aligned with uh, Women's Month and aligned with Youth Month. Um, yeah. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is ask um, <clears throat> my colleague Vusi Skosana to speak to this slide, if you can. Vusi. Thanks, uh, Mr. Kat. Honorable Chair, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, this slide was just to articulate how uh, the work of TIA um, through universities. Uh, that are closely affiliated with NIPMO related to a disclosure of knowledge generated within higher education institution through the technology transfer offices um, as depicted on the Ember box. At the heart of, of TIA's work is the network of technology stations. Um, 18 of those across the country at nine universities uh, within the Department of Higher Education and Training. These technology stations uh, are currently piloting nine initiatives uh, at different uh, activities related to co-location, sharing of uh, infrastructure and facilities, training of trainers where we, we are upskilling and also uh, uh, bringing knowledge into the facilitators, uh, undertaking work integrated learning. We also make available high level graduates and researchers uh, to be seconded into uh, supporting uh, frontier technologies that can be adopted into various uh, communities and, 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 and uh, within respective municipalities targeting SMEs and industries, those are located there. Chair, we also believe that uh, these links and, and engagements can give opportunities uh, for curriculum uh, reforms within TVETs. Most importantly, Chair, this uh, engagement with uh, TVETS uh, is more collaborative process to expand uh, into society and community needs where most TVETS and colleges are physically located. Our recent uh, relationship that we signed off is with the Tswane South uh, Campus College in uh, Odi in Mawapane, where we are scaling up our technology station in textile and clothing. Uh, to be integrated within the TVET the colleges. We believe this model the chair will uh, facilitate the adoption and the use of um, IP uh, towards our communities uh, where we link with um, uh, the colleges that can also uh, be brought into local products and services while we continue to upgrade our critical, critical traits and skills occupation to be absorbed within our communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chisani. Could you put up the next slide, please? Okay, so I think then that brings to a close uh, Tia's part of the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Garth. And uh, Chairperson, I need to maybe make a note here that due to the limits in uh, the amount of slides that we were able to present to the portfolio today, uh, I can mention that TI has some fantastic um, examples of how they've impacted. And I'm sure that they can share maybe during the question and answering session some of these real impacts uh, that they have made. If we now move on to the last um, 
uh, agenda item for today to present on the South African patent landscape. I believe that Garth and the colleague from the Technology Innovation Agency has touched on this, and which is very important for South Africa as a proxy indicator. Um, if we um, look at the World Intellectual Property Organization, World Intellectual Property Indicators for 2022, we can see that patent applications specifically grew by 3.6% in 2021, um, which follows an increase of 1.5% in 2020 and a, an expected drop of 3% for 2019. Interestingly, we note that two thirds of the global patent filing activity took place in Asia, and that China has now surpassed the USA with the most patent applications received and filed, um, double that of the US um, second ranked country of the United States of America. If we look more closer to home, we can see that South Africa has seen a marked increase in the number of patent filings, as well as the number of granted patents in 2021 compared to 2020. We in fact see a 64% increase uh, in patent filings divided into 45% non-resident and 19% resident patent filings, and a staggering 76% increase in the number of patent granted, um, attributed to 69% uh, for non-residents and 7% for residents. If we look into this data a bit more, we can make some assumptions. And these assumptions for this increase may be the China's improved patent generation that they are filing, and specifically their focus on Africa. And we have seen a decline in patent generations from the US, Germany, UK, and Russia. What we have also seen that our South African Patent Office, or the CIPC, has reduced the time in registration of local patents, which might um, be a reason for this marked increase in number of granted patents that we are seeing. We also know that some of our South African law firms are putting packages together for filing in South Africa and Nigeria called the Sunny Patent, a uh, Sunny package. Um, which we've seen has been um, quite well received by the international community and which we believe has re re um, resulted in the increase in patent filings and granted patents in South Africa as well as Nigeria. Unfortunately, we saw also that women inventors only accounted for 16.5% of all inventors listed in the Patent Cooperation Treaty applications in 2021. So internationally, we can see that women is well underrepresented when it comes to being inventors uh, in patent applications. Um, as part of tracking uh, intellectual property indicators, the Department of Science and Innovation, together with the NIPMO office, as well as service providers launched the South African Survey for Intellectual Property and Technology Transfer at publicly funded institutions. This, we have run our second survey, which was published in June, 2021. And I'm happy to say that the third survey implementation is well underway. Um, of particular notices that we saw that for the second survey, we had a 100% response rate in, that means that all 27 higher education institutions and the 11 Schedule 1 institutions, typically our science councils, responded to this survey. This survey then covers, the second survey covered the period for 2014 to 2018. If we look at the patent data in more detail, we can see that over the survey period, 81% of our universities and science councils had an active patent portfolio. During the period, they reported an over 1,250 disclosures, actionable disclosures, which means they take it onto their system, they are gonna work with it. There is some social or economic benefit that they can see. And of that, 94% of our institutions were able to do these types of disclosures to NIPMO. We saw that these disclosures increased by 23.7% and that the total number of actionable disclosures managed by our universities and science councils more than doubled 
over the survey period from 2014 to 2018. Over 700 patent applications were filed by universities and science councils, and almost 80% of our institutions reported at least one patent application filed. We have seen over the period a slight downward trend in patent applications, and we put forward that possible reasons for this could be an improved capacity within the institutions to conduct in-depth assessments of whether the patent application might be new or novel or inventive, and therefore with this increased capacity and skill, they will not file something that they know would not necessarily get a granted right. It might be because of budget constraints or others that we still need to investigate. We can see that over the period 2014 to 2019, over 900 patents were granted. 57% of institutions indicated that they have had a granted patent over the server period and that the total number more than doubled. If we look at patent families, um, for those that may be not as au fait with intellectual property, intellectual property is territorial in nature. Therefore, if there's no such thing as an international patent, and you have to file in each country where you want protection. So we refer to patent families as filing of protections of the same subject matter in more than one country. So if we look at these patent families, we can see that the total number being managed uh, or granted by our universities and science councils have increased quite significantly over the period. And that almost 60% of our institutions reported that they managed one or more of these patent families comprising of a patent granted in at least one jurisdiction or country. And as we can see over this period, the number of such patent families almost tripled. Looking more to IP transactions, startups, spin out companies, and the commercial aspects, we can see that over the period, our universities and science councils formed 55 startup and spin out companies. We were fortunate enough, as NIPMO, DSI, and Technology Innovation Agency, to have a meeting yesterday where the acting CEO, Mr. Patrick Capri, specifically spoke about how we need to do more in an understanding who are these spin-out companies and what the Technology Innovation Agency, as well as NIPMA, can put forward to assist in creating more companies and assisting these companies to thrive. What we see from the survey results is that about 40% of our higher education institutions and only about 20% of our science councils formed startup and spin out companies. 70% of the startup and, uh, startup and spin out companies formed were only done by about 11% of the institutions, or four if we have to give a number. On the upside, these startup and, uh, start and spin-out companies employed over 300 people. And if we look over the period 2008 to 2018, we can see that 100 startup and, uh, start and spin-out companies formed since 2008, 95% from higher education institutions, and 72 still remaining operational in 2018. I'm sure that the committee members are all very afraid with the high failure rate of startup spin out and small companies. So it is quite impressive to see that 72 remained operational as at 2018. We also saw that over 290 licenses and 40 assignments were concluded with around about 40% of these transactions coming from our higher education institutions, 40% uh, of our higher education institutions and science councils concluding these IP transactions. Again, we saw that a small group of our institutions uh, attributed to the majority of these licenses. And it is our goal as NIPMO and NSTR, specifically with the interventions that they are doing, to empower our other universities and science councils to also conclude more transactions and make impact. The number of licenses to South African registered organizations 
is substantially higher than foreign registered organizations. And that is fantastic to see, seeing that our publicly funded R&D is plowed back into our economy. And 22% of our institutions reported that a licensed intellectual property became available for public or commercial use during this period. Out of all of these licenses concluded, we saw that just over 235 IP transactions yielded um, revenue, um, accruing to about 185 million rand in um, revenue that was generated with these licenses, and an increase of 67% in reported total IP transaction revenue over the period. Uh, possibly my favorite indicator is that out of all of these revenue that accrue to our universities and science councils, the IPR Act mandates that the universities and science councils benefit share with their IP creators. And we can see that over the period, our researchers um, was entitled to and received over 23 million rand in commercialization revenue that was paid to over 270 IP creators and enablers. Some concluding remarks on the patent development landscape. We can see that IP from publicly funded, if we focus on intellectual property from publicly financed research and development, we can see that uh, our institutions, universities and science councils re represented five of the top 10 patent cooperation treaty applicants. We also saw that institutions, universities, and science councils contributed on average between 18 to 20 percent of resident patent filings. In other words, of all patent filings made over the period 2014 to 2018, our universities and science councils contributed to almost a fifth of those patent applications. However, there's always room for improvement. And the survey interestingly indicated that an increase in research and development expenditure did not necessarily lead to an increase in IP creation. Possible um, assumptions can be that with the closure with COVID, our research labs were closed and therefore um, IP creation could not happen or research could not necessarily happen that resulted in actionable disclosures. And we're not sure why. So we are, this results require further investigation to understand the reasons for this trend a bit more in detail. We also noted that our universities um, offices of technology transfer, this is the office within our universities and science councils that's responsible and engages with TIA for seed fund, as Garth has mentioned, or responsible work with closely with the um, technology stations, as Vusi has mentioned, but we've noticed that 76% of them reported a lack of certain skills within the technology transfer office. As NIPMO and TIA, we are working to understand what these certain skills are and to address them. And what we found is it's not just a, a paper-based thing, it is a mentoring. It is an on-the-job training skill that is required. We have also noted, or our institutions have noted, about 80% reported that they did not have sufficient funding for technology development, upscaling and commercialization. And although TIA is doing a fantastic job in assisting with the, with the TIA seed fund and the technology development fund, um, more can be done. And to some extent, the innovation fund that was established by the Department of Science and Innovation is trying to address some of these shortfalls identified. And I'll deal with that in the slide next. We also concerningly saw that 23% of our higher education institutions and 9% of our science councils did not have a formal process in place to conclude IP transactions. And 39% of our higher education institutions and 54% of our science councils had no formal process in place to form startup and spin out companies. If we want to make a difference in this country, and, and we understand, I think Garth said it so beautifully, SMMEs is going to be, is the backbone of our economy. And diffusing information and diffusing intellectual property to people that can make economic and social impact is important. It is therefore important that we have to have all of our science councils and all of our higher education institutions having formal, efficient processes in place 
to conclude IP transactions and set up startup companies so that we can truly make an impact. I have two slides with regards to the Innovation Fund, which is the business innovation support instrument for locally developed intellectual property. The background is that this Innovation Fund, which was endorsed by the Cabinet and announced in the Sinan 2016, is envisaged to bridge these gaps that we've been identifying and to accelerate the development of a much higher proportion um, of South African oriented innovations. The Innovation Fund is importantly complementary to what TIA, IDC and the PIC is already doing and creating also providing money to these institutions to create an investment pipeline. To this, the IP Fund um, has three stages, at early stages, including pre-commercialization, seed innovation-based startup, um, and innovation commercialization funding that they will provide, market development and launch, and growth and expansion. It is a strategic focus that the investments in the early development and expansion stages of technology-based South African firms are met, and that follow on financing for the full industrialization and deployment of large-scale R&D incentives are provided for and catered for. To date, we see that 64% um, were previously um, governed 64% were previously government-funded enterprises, which received this, and 36% went to private sector. Um, the Innovation Fund private sector leverage is almost six times. Here are some very good stories which the um, investment, uh, Innovation Fund has invested into, investment specifically in the health sector with regards to artisan biomed, which is the adoption of precision medicine-based applications. And the Innovation Fund investment resulted in Artisan Biomed securing further money. We also have Impulse, who is developing two medical device prototypes that enable low-strength citizens, for example, children and uh, people with disabilities, as well as elderly people, to easily self-activate them in the case of emergencies and to ultimately um, save lives. We have uh, the Innovation Fund has provided support for clinical trials, upscaling marketing and branding, and okay, buy farms, just to mention a few success stories for the localization of biomanufacturing capabilities. I'm sure that our TR colleagues have all been part of um, these activities as well and can talk to them further. Uh, but committee members, Thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you on the activities of NIPMO, uh, the Technology Innovation Agency, and to have a broader perspective on the patent landscape of South Africa in general, as it relates to publicly funded intellectual property. We are very honored to present. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, Ms. Charlesley and to the acting CEO of TIA and his colleagues for that presentation. In um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, we uh, respectfully submit this presentation and now very much look forward to the further engagement with you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, DDG Detoy. Um, I see, I don't see D, uh, DM on the platform. So I think we can go straight into questions from members, inputs and comments. Um, on my side, I really want to appreciate, and I'm so sorry if I can already start noting inputs from members. I am so sorry if I get your the pronunciation of your name incorrectly. Uh, Ms. Charlesley? Absolutely no problem. The people in the office call me Jet, so you can, anything goes, no problem. <laughs> okay, but how do you pronounce it? Uh, Jetani. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Um, so as Zatani was saying towards, I think she was just about to complete the last two slides. And, you know, she so passionately expressed how um, it's important for us to aid uh, universities, TVET colleges, SMMEs, um, with the ability to, be, uh, to conclude IP transactions. And I mean, when I was just looking at um, the first couple of slides, it is concerning that um, you know, in the main, we 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 have um, yeah that in the main it was universities and 
uh, academic institutions that um, were were better, were, were more compliant um, with these particular processes. And so, you know, I hope that as, as we've identified this as a key problem, that we are putting together solid mechanisms to ensure that um, we, we, we open up and we are, we are as inclusive as, as possible and that non-institutional entities are capacitated to comply with legislation um, to ensure this inclusivity. So I think that's, that's for the committee, impact is so important. So um, what I was hearing from, from your, your sentiments towards the end and noting that this is a, um, a problem that was identified, what is most important for us is to ensure that um, the science, that the innovation that we put forth, the science we put forth, the technology we put forth um, has a direct impact on the ground. And we can ensure that by uh, making sure that you know processes um, of ownership of IP are as uh, inclusive as possible. So, so we really want to appreciate what what you said there towards the end. Um, I see that the targets for I think it's slide twelve. Uh, no, slide eleven. The targets for inclusive development are quite high, um, and and even the actual. Uh, performance there is is quite high, and I, I, from my you know simple understanding, I think this is good because if we are focusing our energies towards inclusive, um, de well, the development of 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 inclusive technologies or technology for inclusive development, that that is exactly what we speak to because we believe that um, whatever we are innovating ought to be inclusive and work towards ensuring that we we, we, we better the livelihoods of citizens. Um, there's, I think in terms of the targets around women and youth, we're doing much better. I mean, in certain aspects, it's just below. And I think we can, of course, work on that. Um, but generally, you know, there does seem to be progress in that regard. We, we, we need to do a lot more when it comes to um, ensuring that, um, people with, with disabilities are able to use um, their IP to transform the ownership of, of the economy. So I think we need to just really strengthen um, the, the element of persons with disabilities. Um, and then I want to understand, um, so Vembe Tivet College, Vembe Tivet College in Limpopo has a very strong um, are we still flighting the presentation? If we can stop flighting the presentation, please. Okay. The Embed Tivet College has a very strong incubation hub, and that is something that we 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 were so happy to witness as a committee during our oversight visit there. Um, one would, and you know, they were able to take us through how they support their student from gaining the skill uh, to the work integrated learning to um, uh, you know yeah so to the work integrated learning and to conceptualizing their business to formulating partnerships with cap uh, with you know those who may have capital um, and ultimately also getting their IP and an end so I mean I know you have tried to give us some sort of uh, idea of how what the interface is, I think it's slide um, 15. But um, I mean, I'd, I'd want to know if, if colleagues are aware of the work that's being done at Vembe Tivet College and if you, you know, um, have, well, if, yeah, what, what is the interface there if, if, they, if there is one that you are clearly aware of and how can we sort of replicate that um, across other teammate colleges. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> um, I see Honorable Mananiso's hand is up. Honorable Mananiso, Honorable Poshov. There was another hand that was up. There were three hands. I think it was Honorable Sibia. Um, and I see Honorable Khakal. Honorable Mananiso. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me start by reaffirming that you, you are making sense in terms of what you have just uh, presented as clarity seeking questions. And I must uh, actually appreciate all the three presentations. And Chair, one would want to just alert the 
department that at least during our oversight, we were actually impressed about the work of TIA because of when we do oversight, we always emphasize on the touch and feel and see of these particular programs in, in our lab, in our basis. So I would want to just uh, make them aware that at least we, we saw some of their work, as you indicated uh, uh, about the Vembe College. Uh, Chairperson, I, I think one would want to indicate that on the issue of inclusive technology, we, we, we cannot speak more about because of every time when we meet with DSI, that is one of the part that we think that transformation is on a slow pace and it's as if the department is not committed. I like what you said when we met with the head to say, it is important that when we speak about social compact, we're not speaking about uh, the private sector, but us as department. So I, I think um, DSI must check with Sandra in terms of what is it that they are doing to make sure that they include people with disability. Because of with them as well, they've been having a, like they, they, they've been not addressing the issue of equity in terms of people with disabilities. But now with their program of going to the ground and ensuring that they mainstream people with disability into their programs, it starts, they start now making sense that the department is for all. So it is important that as departments as well, we must check in terms of innovations by other departments on uh, actually responding to equities. What is it that we can do? And I want to appreciate as well that indeed, in terms of women and youth, the department is doing well. Uh, we are moving to the right direction. Chair, uh, my question is with regards to TIA linked to, to TVETS. They, they indicated that they've got uh, nine initiatives. Can they indicate to us what are those specific in, uh, initiatives? And as well, if possible, they must give us a breakdown of the demographics, including the as well the the, the locations of, of, of those people per province specifically. And uh, on slide four, uh, when Jan, uh, the lady was presenting, actually, I, I'm not sure about the, the name as well. Uh, there's an present on the presentation. There's an indication of informal knowledge exchange program. So I can, she come, to, can she explain in terms of what type of the program is there? Because I, I, I think for me, when something is being noted as informal, it's as if it's a by the way, but if she can enlighten me in terms of what is actually, uh, what type of the program is that, I'll be happy. Uh, on the issue of uh, IPR Amendment Act, I think we, we, we need to upload the department that Indeed, there's a, a process in place in terms of ensuring that they respond to challenges. However, they didn't give us a specific time frames. If possible, can they give us specific time frames in terms of uh, uh, in a written form so that we can be able to check if whatever that they have committed on, they are doing it. And Chair, my other question is with regards to Tia on the issue of uh, grassroots innovations. I've noted that they've got 139 innovators across and all pro pro nine provinces as well. Can we get a uh, specific breakdowns as well with demographics and as well on the issue of innovation, uh, 26 innovation products produced, can they give those particular products specifically so, so, that, so that we are able to, to know specifically in terms of what are those particular uh, products? Lastly, Chair, it's on the issue, um, the links with, with, with TVET. I have noted that on the slide, uh, they speak on skills and training occupations, and the presenter actually men mentioned the issue of the textile. So can they give us as well other specific occupational trainings so that we may, we, 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 we maybe alert as the, the uh, a PC in terms of what are those particular uh, uh, occupations. Uh, the issue of the survey, DSIIP, I, I just want to check with them in terms of the methodology that was used to conduct this particular survey. That's it from me, Chairperson, thank you.
Thank you, Honorable Mananiso. Sorry, colleagues, I'm using my phone. So it just takes me a bit of time to then move back to, to the platform. Um, thank you, Honorable Mananiso. Honorable Boshoff, can I also understand what it means when we say on slide 17, when we speak of non-residents? Um, yeah, Honorable Boshoff. Okay, I think Honorable Boshoff got kicked off the platform. Um, Honorable Sibia. Thanks, Chaposin. Uh, greetings to everyone. Uh, thanks for your presentation, Chair. Uh, I would like to know. Honorable Sibia, your network is, is poor. I think maybe if you are, can you hear me? Okay, Honorable Sibia, let's give you some time to, to be stable because your network is quite poor. Okay, can I then go to Honorable Khakhal? Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning to you, colleagues and everyone present on the platform. I won't be switching on my video or my camera. We just experienced low shedding, so I'd like to preserve my bandwidth, please. Um, Chair, just one from my side. Um, I, I appreciate the motivation to do better with regards to the participation of people with disabilities or the beneficiation thereof. But I just want to know, because I didn't pick up the reasoning behind we compile reports to uh to look at who, who gets to benefit where and who's participating where we usually have um, reasons for a lack of reaching targets or an overperformance of targets so if we can um have the the committee furnished with the reasons behind why um we, we were unable to reach those targets or what challenges are there um i think if we have a better understanding of the challenges themselves, we'll be able to make better recommendations. Thank you, Chair, that's it. Thank you, Honorable Khakhal. Honorable Chirwa. Thank you very much, uh, person. I'm so sorry, I'm actually traveling. Angazif um, Nangizwana. We can hear you. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, even for the presentation. I think I share um, the concern of, of inclusion, but I think I want to ask in this direction, particularly on how informal communities, for lack of a better word, um, are being involved as, as stakeholders in the conception and development um, of particular of the grassroots and innovation program. Um, I'm asking this because, you know, in as much as we are saying we are transforming the economy for, for new stakeholders in the economy and all of those things, uh, we have to take cognizance of, of, of stuff like the township economy, for example, um, and how we are not only just bringing them on board, but acknowledging acknowledging the kind of, um, of uh, the magnitude of the constituency that particular industry comes with and to not be intentional in including it is the same as, 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 as really just suppressing that particular industry, which is really unfair because of the kind of um, uh, the kind of contribution it has to do, do or give to our economy. And secondly, I wanna find out how many of the 872 find, funded projects um, are projects that are led by women and, and by the youth. And also, if you just let us in on the demographics of the 139 innovators across the nine provinces on how those look like, because then otherwise, uh, the rhetoric about, you know, inclusion and, oh, we are doing this, working towards this really just becomes rhetoric on written paper and not anything that is, that is being done intentionally, like things like, oh, Women's Month or Youth Month. Uh, just acknowledging those particular tenants is not enough. They need to be reflected in the kind of work that is being done as well. Um, because central to avoiding exclusion is, is education, right? Now, on that same point, I want to find out how the process uh, 
um, and, and the development is being trickled down to the most destitute in our societies. Um, you know, I, I get that there's an intention, but what is the systemic development of the process of ensuring that you reach a disabled woman in Lothar Vater in the Eastern Cape? so that this particular process also benefits people that are in vulnerable communities or that are already ostracized from opportunities. And this is not just about, you know, this is a very important conversation that we're having, Chairperson, um, and it's not just a filling the gaps conversation because of particularly our history and, and you know, in regards to women in particular, especially women who also identify as other vulnerable groups, disabled women, queer women, um, you know, immigrant women and all those kinds of things are, are very pivotal tangents um, that we must we must really hammer on because exclusion starts there. Like we know that there is no exclusion if those particular groups are brought on board and not just as observers, not just as pick as filling in boxes. You know, there must be an intentional way, very very intentional. It doesn't come from the sky. Nobody does inclusion. Uh, by chance it is always by intention so if there is no inclusion it's because it is by intention it is by the make that there is no inclusion so please just um clarify this particular point because they're very important one um and 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 the, the reason why we are even here as a country or women even earn less you know despite the fact that our constitution is saying that women must be equal earners and all of those things is because of such things are overlooked it starts here it starts here because now many years um, post this particular process and this particular moment, um, there's gonna be a big group of people that have less uh, knowledge on this particular process developing and then lose interest because there's then four players at the, at the, in the forefront who are primarily men who are spearheading this thing because they got the information as early as possible. And then they also get uh, hailed as people who are more, who are expertised in an industry, in a field, not because uh, of, of, of the fact that there was an intention to be there, but because access to information came freely to them, as opposed to people who are already ostracized, who are already vulnerable, um, who are already, you know, like disadvantaged. And, and, and the fact that we are speaking about on this particular level, really, you know, it's, it's, it's quite saddening to be quite uh, honest with, with everybody, especially the, the, the department as well, that we are still having these conversations that guys, why is there no inclusion? Really, that's, that's the conversation we are having. And this is the regression as well, because now we, we must first deal with the fundamental, the most basic things. We must first deal with the most basic things instead of getting into the real matter um, of, of, of what you have brought to us here, because we are realizing there's people who are being left behind. And this is not a mistake that an entire department makes. This is a amateur, uh, in fact, this is a by gutted. This is bigotry. <laughs> this is quite frankly, this is bigotry that a department makes these kinds of uh, uh, mistakes at this level in this year is quite shameful, honestly. And there must be something very concrete that you come up with to tell us how you're going to resolve this particular thing. I'm um, also taking into cognizance of the of the. The, the the numerical questions I, I asked here, please just give me the details because it re, it will really be um, the the real picture of what exactly is happening. And we can't ex ex accept a, a department that practices bigotry, honestly, not in South Africa, then otherwise the, we need to get into whatever the situation is and really fix it because these are not mistakes you should be making at this level. Thank you very much, Jefferson. Thank you, Honorable Chirwa. Um, can I check on Honorable, okay, Honorable Boshoff is still off the platform. Uh, Honorable CBI, would you like to try again? Okay, I think then we are fine. Those are then the comments and questions um, from members. Um, I, I would like to understand um, from my side if there have been specific time frames that have been uh, put against the actions listed on slide eight of the presentation in relation to um, the amendment process of the IPR Act. So what are the time frames? Have we put any time frames in relation to that? And then is there a correlation between um, the provisions of the Act, of the IPR Act, and, you know, discussions. I mean, I think recently 
was it this year? No, not this year. It was last year. Um, but towards the end of last year, we had a conversation around the open science policy. So um, what, what becomes then the, the correlation and relationship between the IPR Act and what members have spoken to, you know, I think all of us have spoken to the issue of in, in, in inclusivity um, and, and, that, and, and therefore that relationship with, with the whole idea around um, the open science policy. Um, and then there's a lot of articulation around NIPMO, well, under the challenges raised, there's like articulation around um, NIPMO's resources, but also the politics, I think, between, um, yeah, there's some politics around, around NIPMO being uh, the enabler and the regulator. And um, it would be great to also understand how we are overcoming these particular challenges, of course, noting that some of them um, are articulated in the, in the actions, um, noting the challenges raised, and also maybe towards the, the amendments of the Act. But um, I'd want to understand uh, how much money has NIPMO dispersed to institutions to establish and capacitate offices of technology transfer and, um, and and in order to protect IP, um, and then perhaps also sorry, my notes are all over the place. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at at that. I've spoken to the issue of how we are working around um, NIPMO's capacity and its resources. I mean, for example, when Honorable Chiwa says, like, you need to get to the ends and widths and breadths of South Africa. We we'll figure is Lalini that you know even South Africans themselves don't know. And I think for me, I often think of the Northern Cape. You know, just having travelled across the Northern Cape during our oversight last year, there are many places that are so hidden, many communities that are so far, and such a vast province. And that you know, in order for us to really um, speak this inclusivity into existence, we will need the capacity and the resource to go into every corner of South Africa. Um, and, and so, you know, how are we doing in terms of, of our resources to be able to, to achieve such? Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that for now. Yeah. I think, I think let me leave it at that for now. Um, so let me hand over to you then, DDG Tutoy and the team. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. And, and thank you very much to all the Honorable Members. Uh, as, as always, we, we greatly value this engagement with the members of the committee. Uh, thank you for those rich set series of comments and, and questions. Uh, the words of encouragement, uh, I noted uh, Honorable Sibuletswe, the, the words for your the committee's appreciation for, for the work of TIA following your oversight visit. But then of course, members of the committee rightfully insisted on the imperative importance of transformation, of inclusivity. I can, I can assure the honorable members that, that that's also the, the, the leitmotiv, the, the driving force of, of this department under the leadership of, of our minister. It's what is, is espoused in the values of our constitution and indeed in our new decadal plan. That is the commitment to transformation unequivocal. The DSI has a dedicated transformation framework, but of course we can do better. We accept that and, and we look forward to uh, engage with the committee for your guidance to ensure that, 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 that we deliver on those ambitions because our mission is to make sure that science and innovation has concrete co concrete impact in improving the quality of living of, 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 of all South Africans. And for that transformation of the, of the, of the system is, is imperative. We commit, uh, Honorable Chair, um, many members of the, the committee have, have asked for, for detailed specific information in terms of demographic, geographic breakdowns of, of beneficiaries. And and we will provide that 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 information um, as as appropriate, and also where where if we perhaps do not get into the the detail of the discussion today, uh, we can also provide more detailed narrative with regard to the attainment or the non-attainment of specific per performance indicators. Honorable Chair, what I would like to to do now, with with your per permission, is to first invite my colleague 
Acting Deputy Director General, um, Dr. Rebecca Masarimule, for some introductory remarks. The innovation portfolio is part of her portfolio in, 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 in the DSI for, for her reflection. And then revert to Ms. Jatane Sharsley, who can speak specifically to the different questions um, posed pertaining to the NIPMO portfolio, as well as the patent landscape. And then I will invite the acting CEO of TIA, uh, Mr. Patrick Crappy, to lead us in the response to the questions which pertained to TIA, after which, um, before reverting to you, then I will make some concluding remarks. So, um, Rebecca, if, if for, for your remarks, please. No, thanks, acting DG. Um, I'd um, like to first start up by saying, um, just to express my gratitude for the comments from the um, PPC. Some of the comments have been positive, so I was grateful to see that um, you gave compliments to Tia. I, I think they've been um, they've been receiving a lot of harsh comments over the last few years, but I think I think just gratitude that you acknowledged um, the good work that they're doing, and I think they'll take that positive comment with them as they work to improve their organization. Um, I think in terms of the issue of transformation, um, more specifically towards um, issues of persons with disabilities, I think to be honest with you, we really have struggled with that target. You know, we've started a process of collecting information from our implementing agencies, um, you know, that manage some of our large programs, um, our research programs, and our, even our implementing agencies we're finding are struggling with even meeting the requirements um, of, you know, the percentage a person's a disability. This is something that we have given them as a as, as a, a target of, of um, emphasis for over the, the, the near term that they need to really start focusing on, you know, how do you actually increase that number? You know, we've done it in the past with, you know, person, you know, women, um, persons of color, but I think you're going to need specific programs, very specific to um, support persons with disabilities. And I think we can do it successfully. So I think in terms of the comment from um, um, the Honorable um, Chira around, you know, how do you deal with the, um, what we call maybe informal or not as formal um, communities as beneficiaries of grassroots um, and systemic development process. Um, I, I think that comment is something that we don't necessarily have an answer to, but I think, um, again, this is um, your ref your reflections are important to us in the sense that now we need to go away and come back with a systematic approach to deal with these communities. Um, I think really the, the response in some cases are is, is ad hoc, is not as systematic as we would want it to be, and this is something we're going to be looking at. Um, and I think um, in terms of um, overall comments, I'm going to let um, Advocate Jatani um, really respond to some of the detailed questions around the work that she's doing with um, that we're doing with TVET, as well as some of the comments around the specific um, project management um, or the targets linked to the amendment of the IPR Act. Thank you. Jatani, floor to you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you. Jatani, please. Uh, thank you so much, um, Chairperson and colleagues, for this opportunity to respond to the queries. I have about eight comments um, or eight questions that were directed to know that I would like to touch on. The first one was uh, with regards to informal knowledge exchange. What exactly does it mean? What I can say is the reason we spoke about it as informal is that it was not a minister to minister approach, but that NIPMO approached the, the offices, the on the ground offices within universities and science councils in Brazil, in Canada and the UK to understand on the ground what are the issues that they are working with? What are the issues and the best practices that they can share with us? So this was done on a more informal basis to, to gather that information and it was absolutely invaluable what we found from that. And it was um, for that reason that we spoke about it as an informal and not formal engagement as it was not a minister to minister approach, but more an, an office to office approach. With regards to the IPR at timeframes and the request for a written response on our timeframes, this is duly noted and we will provide the portfolio committee with the written timeframes that we um, foresee for the amendments of the legislation in the way forward. 
survey methodology. How we approached the survey is that we had a service provider that assisted the department as well as NIPLO in implementing the survey. There was a questionnaire that um, we are tracking the baseline queries from, as well as looking at some benchmarking with other countries so that we can compare South Africa with international surveys and statistics uh, that is um, that, that is currently going on. I can also just mention that for the third implementation of the survey, that we are working with international bodies such as Autumn, which is the American one, as well as the European um, ASTP or ATTP uh, Association that also have surveys with regards to intellectual property and technology transfer. And in our survey, we want to have some questions that can be used to do international benchmarking, but not just with Europe and, um, and America. We are also looking towards Brazil as well as Malaysia um, to, to benchmark certain questions with them. These were then sent out as methodology, um, uh, as part of the methodology sent out. We had a, the service provider ensured that all the questions were understood with the question um, definitions. Uh, collated and the report uh, being compiled. We do have about seven pages on the methodology and uh, portfolio committee members, I'm happy to share the survey report that is available on the DSI website for you, which is a wealth of information. I think it's about 100 pages each, um, showing various indicators that we are tracking and that we're quite proud of and noting some of the things that we need to um, work on. With regards to the question of non-resident versus resident, what that means is that if you file a patent application, you have to state, or if a patent is granted, you have to state whether you are a South African resident or whether you are not. If you are not, it is it's ticked off as a non-resident. So in that statistics, we can see that the increase um, uh, was broken down into resident and non-resident, and where we saw quite a big increase in non-resident granting and filings, which means that um, there is international interest in gaining patents applications and granted patents in South Africa. With regards to the question of open science, um, we are happy to report as NIPMA, we are working very closely with the Open Science um, Initiative and Board. And we have to, uh, to bear in mind that open science and intellectual property are not contradictory to one another. In fact, they can be very complementary. And so we are working with the Open Science Committee and Board to ensure that open science is acknowledged and the importance is furthered. And also making sure that where there is um, intellectual property that maybe should not be on an open science platform, that it is protected first and then shared on open science platform, just to make sure that you have your intellectual property rights um, protected before sharing it. With regards to the question of NIPMO being an enabler versus a regulator and the potential tension, um, this was something that was noted by the review panel. And as NIPMO, we do not see that tension necessarily. Our enabling role is to educate, is to provide funding, is to enable. And yes, we do need a regulatory, uh, a regulatory uh, process to enforce parts of the legislation. We are fortunate that we have, as part of the legislation, a dispute panel, an independent dispute panel that is um, that is appointed by minister to ensure that when there is an aggrieved party or where they feel that NIPA has not made a correct administrative decision, that they can put forward that to the dispute panel for adjudication. Fortunately, in the past 10 years or 11 years, we have not had any use of the dispute panel or need that the dispute panel had uh, had to, um, oh, there was one case, my apologies. There were one case, but we were able to, um, deal with that case amicably between the parties and get to a conclusion that makes impact for the society. With regards to the amount of OTT funding, the published results in the IP and TT survey states that uh, NIPMO has over the period 2014 to 2018 provided over 260 million rand for expenditure on IP registration and maintenance costs and just over 315 million rand for expenditure on technology transfer operational costs. 
So I think roughly we can say NIPMO expended over the period 2014 to 2018 about 600 million rand for IP prosecution and maintenance costs, costs, as well as capacitating the OTTs, the offices of technology transfer within universities and science councils to, to educate, to, to pay for people to do this very important job within universities and science councils. Um, and, and making that impact. I can maybe note that for as of 2018, we had 170 technology transfer personnel that are situated within the universities. And to the point of the Northern Cape, we're very, very happy to say that we have just concluded an OTT support fund agreement with the Sulplikish University situated in the Northern Cape, so that not only university, that university, but its surrounding community can make the very important impact with IP dissemination, implementation, identification, and hopefully social and economic impact. We also, as part of the Department of Science and Innovation, has other initiatives that was not maybe presented on today, but if I may specifically have the authority to talk about the Regional Innovation Support Program, where they also have specific um, intentional, I think, projects in uh, communities that is maybe less in, less formal, uh, trying to uplift, talk about innovation, educate, and truly making a difference. Uh, I believe that those are the, uh, the those were the questions posed to Nipmo. I will talk. Uh, maybe one last comment is that as part of the TVET initiative. NIPMO with the DSI is doing what we call intellectual property awareness workshops. We have done to date with seven TVET colleges, these intellectual property awareness, talking about what it is, talking about its, its importance and its effect that it can have in, in, in the economy. And this is something that we will be doing ongoing to talk about intellectual property within our TVET colleges. We are also, as NIPMO and the DSI, uh, securing various um, memorandums of agreements with these TVET colleges to further education uh, with regards to uh, intellectual property and intellectual property management. Uh, I believe that the questions with regards to inclusivity, uh, persons with disability, as well as the various questions on grassroots innovations will be best suited to be answered by my colleague from Technology Innovation Agency. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Jatani, and honor Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Indeed, I think uh, Dr. Masuri Muli and Advocate Charlesley spoke to all the questions, according to my list, which were specifically addressed to NIPMO. But I would, again, like to reiterate that we will provide the supplementary information with regard to more detailed analysis on specific aspects as appropriate. I would now like to invite the Acting CEO of the Technology Innovation Agency, uh, Mr. Patrick Krappi, just to introduce um, the TR response to the questions raised by the honorable members. Patrick, please. Okay. Thanks, uh, thanks, DDG. I've been moving around a bit with load shedding, so I have to change venues. Um, I missed quite a bit of the early responses, but I, I had gotten the majority of the questions. And largely, these relate to the information and the grassroots innovation. Um, so I'll talk to that. And the other set is really talking to TVET colleges, how we interact um, with the TVET colleges. Uh, Voices Kosana will speak uh, to that part. Let me speak to the grassroots innovation chair. We presented, as I recall, to the committee led by the uh, DDG as well. Uh, I think it was uh, DDG Mboneni, Mofia, from the department on 25 November around the grassroots innovation program itself, together with one of the other instruments within the Innovation for Inclusive Development program. Uh, we gave uh, quite a bit of uh, information at that session. But the question that you are posing now is, and it's less about the numbers, at least at this point, in terms of the grassroots innovation program, but it's more about who are these people and uh, what are they producing? I won't venture that uh, at this point around the 26 product produced, except to then undertake it as follow-up action that will pro uh, put together information that spells out in detail uh, who these people are. And one more time, it's also about the spatial footprint 
of our grassroots innovators throughout the country, uh, the kind of work that we're doing in the different provinces will provide that data. We have it uh, in, a, in a pie chart form, but I think we'll also provide a bit of the storylines around that. The other question, the, so these are the two actions I'll take away as part of providing further information in the background. We've got very interesting stories, Chair, and thanks for asking that question. Uh, we always don't tell our stories as tier in the level of detail that is required. Um, it's always about space and time that we have to present this information. But uh, this will, I'll, tell you, I'll use that as an opportunity to tell our good story around that because it is a good story that we have. The, the issue that you raised around, and it's a broader challenge around participation of women, uh, participation of people with disabilities uh, within our programs, and to what extent are we addressing this? And what are the actual challenges associated with us reaching out to them? Um, the, there are multiple you know, ways of looking at this. Um, I suppose our system is evolving for me, that's the first point. And so you tend to, in wanting to produce results that are visible, uh, organizations, because uh, we are driven by KPIs and that's how we report. And you tend to work with that which is available to work with. We have a very serious heavy lifting task to do, uh, STR and the DSI in general, really to put measures in place to make sure that we uplift and design very specific interventions that will br bring on board those other you know, constituencies and uh, you know, segments of our society that are left behind. And these are these, they require really deliberate interventions. Um, we are designing GATT uh, reported from our side that on the basis of the analytics that he presented, uh, they have helped us to agree to launch, and this is a, a program specifically, uh, that will be budgeted with a set aside to fund people with disabilities who have innovative solutions that they are developing, but also to put money to develop solutions that address challenges of people with disabilities. So it's important that it's a very focused program and we go out and hand them down and help them. And I think it has to just be focused to make sure that uh, we are focused and uh, we'll collaborate, of course, with other um, forums and platforms that are out there addressing issues and challenges of people with disabilities. So the same goes to, for innovation, women in innovation. I think uh, our data also shows that uh, we have a lot of women who are producing very good results in the system. It really shows the capability of the system um, on how women participate in this. And then we have to really keep pressing on to make sure that we increase the impact of this. When we do the analysis, around, and I'll give an example of the question that warriors. When we talk about licenses uh, developed, we will then ask the question, how many of these were developed by women or technologies uh, that have been assigned? Uh, and I think it's a good question enough to ask, but it's not enough. Um, you have to ask another question that says, how many, of, how many women re are recipients of licenses that they can use to develop companies. And so it's less about only them producing licenses, but it's about them receiving licenses around which they can develop companies. So we are looking at these questions in multiple forms. Uh, so with the grassroots innovation, the one point that I probably didn't make and I need to make is that so we launched this program and we contracted it from the DSI sometime around 2018, we started implementing in 2019. And at the time it was still a concept. And so it was a pilot where we had to first build the portfolio and learn the ropes of how to implement this program, define, um, get some experience in implementing this and understanding the needs of what is it that the grassroots innovator requires? Who are the grassroots innovators? Where do we find them? And I think we've built this portfolio of 139, it's about 150 actually as we speak. Uh, I know that there are some that we are contracting now. We've built this portfolio, but for natural reasons, it is becoming quite heavy for TIA to manage on its own. 
we are now adopting a model where we'll be using implementing partners in the different locations, provinces and districts, where I think it will better be located where the problems are. And uh, it will be driven by the needs of those communities around, and it will be implemented by our partners. It's really to decentralize the model and make sure that it's as inclusive as possible, but it is uh, implemented by people who live the problems. And, and so for us, uh, it's an easier way. What we, we have learned a lot of lessons from this, it has taught us how to design appropriate interventions. So we needed the time before we can decentralize the model to understand it ourselves, uh, so that when we give it to other people, we are able to give them clear direction in terms of what needs to happen. So it's important that these are pilot programs. And Chetani didn't mention, for example, that the Innovation Fund is a pilot for three years from Treasury. And the results of that inform how we position some of these instruments into the future. You spoke about last year from my side about inclusion and really more about consultation with the communities around which we implement these programs. We, we do do consultations, uh, not to the extent that we should. Um, and I think uh, those are the ones that in fact help to inform our own products. Um, to a great deal of the consultations, as I recall, we did quite a few of them online during the height of COVID lockdown level five and four. Uh, to design and improve a lot of our grassroots innovation programs uh, and so on. So there's a lot uh, that we are doing in the background as a system that is learning, as a system that is researching to understand in depth the better, the challenges that are out there, but to design appropriate uh, responses to some of these. And it's really an ongoing challenge that uh, we have to deal with. But consultation, yes, it's a very, very critical element of the work that uh, that we do. So those are the few things I can respond to. I think, Vusi, if you can take the one on TVET colleges. Thank you, CEO. Uh, Chair, um, it, it, it is uh, true that um, our interventions go beyond the occupation of textiles. Uh, we have capabilities that we've developed over the last 10 years around foundry, um, additive manufacturing, uh, which include uh, 3D printing, automation, agro-processing, downstream chemicals, and the likes. We have certainly developed uh, 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 interventions that are based on uh, our um, informed needs, the informed needs of communities. This is because we interact with over 3,000 SMMEs uh, from year to year, including innovators. This is how we develop a, a, a data packs on tailor-made trainings, short learning programs that we have diffused uh, through a Center for Entrepreneurship uh, for, for adoption in various uh, colleges. Chair, in, in Limpopo, we are doing work with um, uh, Mopani South College and Tombi Seleka Agricultural College. Uh, we will provide supplementary uh, information around the demographics of all the work we are doing uh, per, per province. Uh, I think, Chair, most of the questions were articulated very well by the CEO uh, around the need uh, to go, go beyond a needs driven, but rather a systematic response in institutionalizing uh, the work that we do uh, link with TV. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much to uh, again to Dr. Masimiramole and Advocate Charlesley and the Acting CEO Tia and Mr. Skosana. Honorable Chair, I, I do believe that uh, the colleagues, according to my list, have been have addressed all the specific questions um, raised by the honorable members of the committee. Uh, we are certainly very much aware for the important request for more detailed, specific information, the statistical analogy, uh, analysis. Um, for example, with regard to the beneficiaries and participants in programs, and, and we we commit to provide that um, to the committee with, with minimum delay. Uh, the, the topics we discuss, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, today, is they, they're really at the heart of our effort to, through the, the CADO plan, uh, make sure science and innovation impact on our economy and our society, and we look forward to uh, further uh, engagement and, and close cooperation, as always, um, with the honourable members of, of the committee. Honourable Chair, I apologise if we've missed any 
uh, specific uh, questions, then we'll be happy to to respond to that. But um, it's my uh, honor then to, to revert to your honorable chair. Thank you. Thank you, DDG Detoy. Can I ask, what, I asked um, what does non-resident mean? Slide seven, slide yes. 17, yeah. Um, I will just ask Advocate Charlie to specifically to speak to that, um, that that pertains specifically to the, the applicants um, and, and whether whether they um, in this based in the South African jurisdiction or not. But uh, Jatani, if you could just perhaps briefly comment on that. My apologies, Chair. I believe I did touch on it, but let me maybe just reiterate. So um, as we know that uh, applicants that can file for patent applications and granted patents in South Africa, if you file for a patent application and a granted patent in South Africa, you need to indicate whether you are a South African resident or not. If you are not a South African resident, you are marked as a non-resident. And therefore we can see that this increase in percentages for patent applications, as well as granted patents um, increased quite substantially for non-residents. In other words, everyone that's not a South African is deemed a non-resident. And the reason why we believe that that increase in non-residents could be because of the increase in patent filings we receive generally from China. Worldwide, we see the increase in China applications. And um, yes, that, that is the distinction between a resident and a non-resident. I hope, Chairperson, that that is clear. Okay, thank you very much. I think in the written um, submission, it will be also important to explain to us why, you know, why, why would that happen and, and, and what does that mean? What are the, are the are there consequences of that? What does it mean? I mean, because it's a worrying reflect, like, yeah, if I, if I were to look at it as simply, um, me being myself, non-pendulo, I will get alarmed. So I think you need to ease the anxieties and explain to us what are the pros and cons of such and what does that mean? Um, and then maybe even give us the demographics of, um, you're saying by and large, it's attributed to, chi to China or Chinese applications. Okay, who else? Um, is accommodated for there. Honorable Chair, I commit that we will provide that in analysis. Uh, and Honorable Chair is entirely, entirely, entirely correct. I think it's important for us to reflect on what is the impact for South Africa of, of these patents, which are not unique to South Africa, as, as Chitani said, um, with, with regard to patent activity in a global innovation um, system. So we commit to provide that analysis, Chair. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then I want to appreciate what uh, colleagues from Tia spoke to in saying it's also important. It's just not about the numbers, but to understand, you know, who who who's the number, who's behind the numbers that we give, and what exactly are they producing? I mean, I think um, when I remarked on um, the inclusive uh, technologies or technologies for inclusive development. Um, I, I, I wondered what kind of technologies those are. And of course, colleagues from TI have in the past shared with us, you know, some of the work that they've done, but it, it would be interesting just to get an idea of, 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 you know, a couple of those technologies, just so that we can also, you know, I always say to colleagues, the portfolio committee has a role of bringing issues that we identify from our communities or our constituents to yourselves. But we also have the responsibility of taking the information that you share with us to the people so that we can say, this is the work that Tia is doing and this is the impact that it has um, in our communities. So um, that's, that's one aspect. So thank you for that. Apologies, colleagues. Um, and then if you could also, yeah, I think I, I strongly concur with the sentiments around the spatial footprint and where exactly, you know, because for example, um, one would want to, to know, and you can, you can respond to this in writing. When we say that there are four institutions of higher learning that are responsible for 70% of the startup companies that are formed, you know, which institutions of higher learning are those in particular? Because it would be of concern to us if we realize that it's, for example, your UPs, um, your, your VITs, you know, uh, your 
Stellenbosch, uh, your UCT, because then in terms of the spatial footprint, then we're not achieving what we want to achieve, right? So, so that's also important for us to get a, an understanding on. Um, and then, uh, whilst whilst advocates, um, Charles Lee says, um, you know, they, they as 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 NIPMO are not necessarily a well, they, they're not of the view that there is a particular contradiction between it being an enabler and it being a regulator. Um, it would be important for NIPMO to reflect on why the review panel um, identified that particular concern or challenge, right? So reflect on it and ensure that we can do away with a perception. If it's a perception, then we must work towards addressing the perception. Um, and then, of course, the committee will be interested in, in understanding when, you know, the amendments to the Act then will be brought to the committee and Parliament also gets involved in, in terms of that, that process. I, I mean, are we looking at the end of this year? Are we Are looking at the start of next year? Uh, you'd be aware also that our term is coming to an end. So um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an initiative of this sort, the committee would want to play an influential role, <laughs> afford us the opportunity before the end of our term. To, to, to leave quite a significant um, mark in, in the national system of innovation. Um, so, so, you know, we would be interested in finding out how far we are and where we then start to play a more influential role. Um, and, and then, um, yeah, I think we, we have an appreciation of the fact that, you know, in order for us to, to strengthen this type of work, we need to strengthen um, the higher education, science, technology, and innovation landscape. Uh, DSI can't do it on its own. Neither can the institutions. Neither can, uh, you know, small business. We we really need to work collectively um, to to achieve the type of inclusivity that we've all been reiterating. Um, so yeah, so I think that by and large brings us uh, to an end. Um, but I think we must appreciate that uh, the, the IPR Act and NIPMO um, have had a positive impact on the national system of innovation. Um, and of course, there are some unintended consequences in terms of you know, what has been identified even by the review panel. Uh, and then we must acknowledge the recommendations that have been put forth and um, include them in the uh, proposed amendments of the IPR Act. Uh, and, and make reflections and considerations on the repositioning of, of NIPMO within the national system of innovation and enhance the role of NIPMO uh, in ensuring, for example, the utilization of IP for publicly financed research and development. So I think that is by and large the sentiments of, of the committee. Um, and then I think we also want to acknowledge that the uh, that in 2022, the um, Science, Technology and Innovation Indicators report um, published by, by NACI stated that uh, changes in the levels of investment in research and development affect innovation and economic performance, and that um, reduced investments in research and development have resulted in fewer scientific publications, uh, patents granted, receipts um, of, 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 um, from the sale of South African intellectual property. And so, um, you know, South Africa is ultimately not necessarily realizing the full socioeconomic gains from its research and innovation inputs. And we need to do a whole lot of work in terms of that. And I think NIPMO, uh, TIA, our colleges, our institutions, small businesses, the women and, and, and people living with disabilities um, in our various communities can contribute significantly to that. So, um, so yeah, so let's continue to, to, to do the work that we, I think, have a, an appreciation of. Um, but it mustn't just be an appreciation of, let's, you know, we must have impact. We must make the necessary legislative changes that must be made. Um, we must inject the necessary resource that is uh, needed. But with what we have, um, and given the reflections that we have made, we must do the best that we can do. So, um, um, yeah, I think that can bring us ultimately to the end of our meeting. Um, so the, uh, we were
my hand was up. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm using my phone, so I would not have seen that. Apologies for that. Um, let me take Honorable Tudor. I was concluding, but I'm noting that Honorable Tudor probably lifted her hand before my conclusion. Let me take her her hand quickly, and then we'll end our meeting officially. Honorable Tudor. Yes, yeah, I, I I can see what was so clear, and I'm like I had been raising my hand for a while. I just want to say, you know, like, and I know I've said this, but to really drive it home, when we speak about transformation. Chairperson, we are saying in the most simplest terms, and I'm borrowing for, from the biblical words here, the first become last and the last become first. Now, in an instance that we use the, 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 the term that we are doing economic transformation, we're also vying towards that direction. Uh, but we can stay... Honorable Chira, I think your network is unstable. Or is it my network? No, I'm struggling too, Chair. Economically is the last. Honorable Chira, we can hardly hear your input. how those people have been benefited to be doing that kind of work. We can't even show the most base are black women from townships or 600. All right, not fine. Honorable Chira, I think your network is unstable. Okay, I think we've lost, I don't know, Honorable Chira. Okay, colleagues, the network, honorable Chiro's uh, network is, is unstable. So, um, but I think she was just trying to go um, to re-emphasize the importance of transformation. Um, with that being said, colleagues, thank you so much. And um, uh, we look forward to, our, to the responses, um, which we will request from yourselves in the next seven working days. Um, we were supposed to adopt minutes uh, today. However, we do not meet quorum. And so we'll have to, uh, uh, move that to next week Wednesday and um, that then brings us to the end of our meeting thank you so much and I wish you all a restful weekend thank you very much honorable chair thanks chair thanks PPC recording stopped